welcome to the afternoon session of the CalSTRS and CalFERS 2021 Diversity Forum. We certainly want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And I hope you have found the morning sessions to be informative and helpful. This afternoon sessions are full of uh, important content being delivered by very accomplished people uh, and great panels throughout the afternoon. So enjoy the afternoon session. I'm thrilled to uh, be able to introduce today, Sarah Maynard to you. Sarah is the global head of external inclusion and diversity strategies and programs at the CFA Institute. In her role, Sarah leads a global industry recognized portfolio of inclusion and diversity programs for CFA Institute stakeholders, CFA charter holders, CFA member societies and investment institutions to champion the cause of greater diversity in the investment management industry. Sarah has extensive experience in the industry and has held other positions including the Director of Career Development at the CFA Society of the United Kingdom, the founder of the Society's Women's Network, which she transformed into the Inclusion and Diversity Network, which now has a membership of over 1,200 investment professionals at some feet. She has also worked as a fund manager an analyst at both an asset manager and asset owner for which she managed an equities portfolio of $3.3 billion. Sarah has an MA in English literature and language from Trinity College, Oxford. She holds the Associate of the Society of Investment Professionals and is an associate member of the Charter Institute of Personnel and Development. She serves on the advisory board of Girls Who Invest and on the CEO Advisory Council of Diversity Project North America. Sarah has also been a state public school governor for over a decade and a charity trustee working with disadvantaged communities. We are honored, Sarah, to have you with us here today. Please help me in welcoming Sarah Maynard. Maynard to our diversity forum. The floor is all yours, Sarah. Thank you, Harry, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. I'm going to just share my screen now, um, and then that way I hope I can walk us through some of the details that um, I hope I can share from across the CFA family, really, um, on a global family. Um, and as Harry mentioned, being a, a former school governor, I, I'm particularly pleased um, to engage with you all today, thinking about the communities that councillors and CalPERS serve, you know, their public servants, and it's great that uh, you know, we can be sharing um, the work that we're doing on DEI today um, with all of you. So really, without further ado, let's move the conversation into the action piece, um, because although diversity is an important topic to discuss, we know what's really needed now is action, and we're looking uh, you know, across these slides I'm going to share with you today, um, action that members and societies are taking, um, action by um, our research program, which is an experimental partner program, which has um, included CalPERS and State Street, represented by Ronald Hanley today. Um, and then we'll finish with um, a little look at the work that we're doing um, to launch a diversity, equity, and inclusion code. And CalSTRS and CalPERS have been very much involved in driving that work as well. So um, another great reason to be very pleased to be with you all today. So let's start by looking, taking a gender lens really across the investment profession. As you can see here, it's a global picture and what we're, what we've focused on is the difference between representation of women in, in national workforces um, and where women are represented in the industry. And really what that shows us is in almost every area, um, in almost every country, they're a long way short of what they should be. There are a few exceptions. Um, the red arrow obviously highlights the US and I'm, I'm giving you something of a, a sort of US focused view today. Um, but I think that uh, this is often a, a good way to think about um, 
women and minorities because we're just starting to gather data um, on uh, our racial and, and ethnic diversity that we haven't really discussed before. So we've had a lot longer um, database on women, but let's say we're just starting to add um, greater demographic detail. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to share that literally fresh today, because we've just had the results of two surveys we conducted earlier in the year, um, asking demographic questions for the first time across our membership base. And of course, what we can see, which will come as no surprise, I know, to our audience, is that those numbers are, you know, are deeply disappointing on race. So although we have um, Asian membership um, is, is around 14 percent, essentially black and African-Americans are only 3 percent and Hispanic and, and Latinx members are 4 percent. So essentially, those numbers are a long way short of where we think they should be, where we want them to be, and, and where you know, they should be given that we know talent is equally distributed across all populations. So in sum, we think the industry is missing out on talent, and we think that these individuals are potentially missing out as you know, these underrepresented communities as both customers being served and also as professionals not having access to the opportunities that we really think that they should have. And then if we take that lens and look at the roles held within the industry, again, I mean, this is a disappointing chart because it doesn't even get to 50%. Um, and also, of course, if we think about the emerging signs of improvement in the pipeline, and I'll come to that in a minute, um, obviously to get to these kind of roles, that takes quite a few years. It takes a lot of experience. And typically in the Americas, um, our women mem you know, membership is uh, has, typically about 18, 18 years in the industry. So essentially the pipeline leaks and it, it's a long time to get to the, the sort of end of it, if you like. Um, and that's really what we're seeing in the data here. And when we think about the data around um, race and, eth and ethnicity again, the numbers are you know, obviously typically worse than the ones that we're seeing on gender. Um, so essentially work to do. And then if we look at this recent data that we gathered in March and April of this year, in really sort of the teeth of the pandemic, then what we're finding is that not only women, but women of colour are more likely to be, as a result of the pandemic, to be unemployed. They're more likely to be having to home educate their children at that point in the year. Um, and in professionals, um, women of colour, in EMEA and APAC are also more likely to be caring for dependents with special needs. Um, and that's something that was sort of typically part of their lives prior to the pandemic as well. So what we're conscious of are the additional pressures that professionals face and, and need to be balanced and accommodated um, when their colleagues within firms start to think about you know, how they can create more inclusive environments. However, um, it isn't all um, you know, essentially bad news or, or depressing news because you know, having set the scene with some downbeat metrics, what I do think we're starting to see are signs of change. I think we can begin to identify if we look at the gender split in terms of candidate growth, we can see the beginnings of an inflection point. So obviously the chart in terms of the membership looks very stuck. It has been in a very similar position for a while, despite a lot of good work in this field. Um, but what we're seeing in terms of our candidates is that members are, um, candidates are signing up, women candidates are joining actually at a faster rate than ever before. Um, and then if we think about our top markets for members as well, um, we're actually starting to see some good signs of growth within some cases women members actually moving forward. Now, obviously, China's a sort of standout here because what's really interesting about mar the market in China is that women see the investment industry as a great one for them. They are keen to take the CFA. They're very focused on getting further education in that market. Um, and it's that sort of positioning, which I think is really quite illuminating for other markets as well, that you know how you position and the industry and attract women into it. You know, we can learn from China and that's really something that we're very much trying to do. So in order to sort of take that kind of learning, we're thinking about where do the pipeline decisions occur? And I think what again is helpful here is that this is data that reflects male and female split, 
but we we know that um, minorities tend typically to be making those decisions early in the same way that women typically do. And I think there's something about neither women nor people of colour are seeing themselves in this industry and therefore they're, they're almost excluding it before they get started. And I think that's you know, something that the industry working collaboratively can start to address because what's interesting about how different generations perceive the investment industry and, and indeed business in general um, we've got some great data from Deloitte 2018-2020 uh, survey, their millennial survey, where they're looking at millennials and Generation Z. And essentially what we're seeing is folks who are far more values focused, far more interested in what's the purpose of the organisation that they're joining. And in fact, they would see organisational diversity, equity, inclusion as a measure of organisational success and business success. So it's a really different way of thinking about their future careers, <clears throat> excuse me, and the organisations that they intend to, change, to, to join. So lots of useful data, I think, here for the industry to consider as we start to reach out and, and form, I think, more effective ways of, of attracting the underrepresented communities who, as I say, historically have not seen this as the industry for them. So if we think about you know, what we see from, from our societies, and we have global societies of 160 plus across the world, and what's I think very encouraging there is we're actually seeing that they um, are really putting a big focus on inclusion and diversity. They will frequently acknowledge, or as you can see in the data, that they are at an early stage in that work, but they are very much engaged with it. They see it as important. And to that end, they, they're hosting round tables, they're running training, they are essentially revising their board approaches. So they're including a succession planning in a much more structured way. And over half of them already have gender diversity committees and they are adding groups to advance race and ethnicity. So all really some encouraging signs across the sort of CFA community. And then I think the other piece, and I think this is probably almost my sort of favourite bit of data, is that it's actually coming from the grassroots, because what we might have thought when we sent out this survey um, to society leaders was that we would see the majority of the, of the demand coming from firms, we're actually seeing it from the membership. So I think we're starting to see some significant traction. Now, what I'd like to do now is sort of change the pace slightly and do a deep dive into the work of the Experimental Partner Program. Um, it's, it's been experimental in a way that perhaps we couldn't possibly have envisaged. The program commenced um, in the first half of 2019 uh, and it finished at the end of last year. So it has really been an extraordinarily experimental journey with these 41 firms, as I mentioned, including Cowper's and, and, and State Street amongst um, many other eminent firms. And what we've done with them is we've had these intense calls, we've had individual one-to-ones on a quarterly basis, we've had topical calls where we've got everybody together and we've had some amazing collaborative sessions where we explored ideas in detail. Um, and we've also gathered a lot of data through surveys um, and, and through um, some very detailed feedback forms that we've had from these firms. So we will be producing a report next month uh, and we think we'll have you know, a great deal more to share. So this is some early sight of, of what this programme has produced. Essentially what these firms were doing was working on up to three of these recommended actions. And again, focus on action here. And they emerged out of our driving change report, which itself emerged from roundtables with industry leaders held in 2017 and 2018. And essentially what we were capturing was what these organisations thought that they, as part of the industry, should be doing to really improve um, the, their metrics to, to advance diversity, equity and inclusion. What I think becomes very interesting is when you start to dig into why they were doing this work. And I think you know, various of the speakers who have already focused on the importance of essentially greater inclusion, greater diversity driving better business outcomes. And I think there's some very interesting research if we perhaps reference the work of Scott Page at the University of Michigan and his diversity bonus. 
Um, and, and then there are, there are a host of others, or if you think about the Goldman Sachs report on women and minority run funds performing better over that you know, market crisis that we saw in March of last year. So there's some really interesting data which tends to suggest that actually having diverse teams really does produce better results. And of course we know, uh, and again speakers have referenced this, that diverse teams around the table have to be working in an inclusive environment in order to get the benefit of that diversity. But we also know that this is absolutely vital when it comes to complex decision making and analysis, which of course is what the investment industry is all about. And then the other piece of this is that understanding when we're communicating with colleagues who are unlike us, we will work harder, we'll create a better argument, we'll search for greater evidence, and we will provide you know, more robust arguments as, as to, to why the case that we're presenting is valid. And those things are quite powerful in the sense of like just improving the rigor of decision making process. Um, when we think about that diversity piece, and we know that, as I've already illustrated, the industry is not as diverse as it should be, what we're saying to firms and the communication that we've had with them when they're doing that focus and, and, and say coming up with why they're doing the work, that firms can become inclusive before they become diverse. So essentially they can do the work, they can put the organization or the systems, and they can start the sort of change of behaviors even before they hire diverse individuals. Because in a sense, you know, we are all diverse, we are all more than one thing. And we all have sort of multiple aspects to ourselves. And if we start to think about that in an inclusive environment, then we're essentially getting an organization ready to, to not only hire, but to retain um, underrepresented communities who, as I say, otherwise we haven't been able to reach. So essentially, it's, it's great to see that focus on business outcomes and, and the reasoning. The other piece I would just highlight is client demand has been quite a big factor. Um, and we have picked up in the experimental partner research that whereas perhaps pre previously uh, RFPs and the like were actually um, probably only um, asking about diversity data around 5% of the time, even to a couple of years ago, now we're seeing um, essentially requests for data 40% of the time. So there's you know, a big significant shift in client demand, but that's not the only reason that firms actually want to do this work. In terms of the ideas selected, I think this is really giving us a great insight into where the industry actually is. And you can see that foundational concepts are the biggest piece of the pie. And that's essentially because the industry is not advanced. You know, the metrics tell the story. Um, it's not perhaps as advanced as other knowledge-based industries have become. Um, and so essentially doing the foundation work is, is a representation of, of where these firms are. So they're self-selected. They've created this focus on DEI, um, but they know that there's a, a long way to travel. So, as I say, a focus on funda uh, foundational concepts. The other big piece of it, I think this is worth mentioning, um, is that talent acquisition and talent development. So essentially seeing as a way to, to change the uh, you know, inclusion within the firm, change diversity, both through hiring, but also through what's happening around promotion and retention. The other piece I would highlight is the importance of communication in all of this, because explaining why they're doing the work is part of that more inclusive approach. And firms found typically they really needed to over communicate in order to just get the messages across and also that they needed to make the, that messaging authentic, that it, it worked best if it came from the, the Black, Asian, Hispanic and Latinx colleagues rather than from an outside academic, that it needed to be owned within the business. Uh, in order for the, those messages to be absorbed. Um, the other piece that typically firms saw was that the initial response was to raise expectations. And then if things didn't move fast enough and developing an impact, there would be some drop off in employee engagement. So there was a little bit of a ride, a roller coaster ride perhaps um, to, to negotiate. And again, communication is really important on that. The other insight I think I'd offer um, to the investors and the audience is that what was interesting was the learning that has to accompany this work. And so whereas leaders were clear and passionate and keen to engage with this work, 
you know, there was a piece of coaching to do, there was learning, there was education. So um, for folks who are accustomed to, you know, the smart folks in investment who are accustomed to essentially grasping concepts quickly, some of the emotional aspects of, of this work, um, you know, took a little bit more time to, to absorb and, and to change, you know, to reflect it in, in changed behaviours. So one of the ways in which that they tackled that um, was really that very focused training, um, particularly for what is often described as the frozen middle, the middle management, who are perhaps unintentionally resilient, resistant um, to this kind of work and the change that they see emerging. Um, so all of these experimental partners were, and, you know, they undertook unconscious bias training, but essentially they changed perhaps how that they how they looked at that um, by realizing that regular training rather than one and done made a big difference. Um, and they also brought in behavioral scientists, neuroscientists, and they expressed this as an aspect of you know that in, that behavior training, the aspect of biases occur because we're not fully rational and that's also important in, in producing better investment decisions and that all fed into in the talent acquisition and talent development sphere of actually being able to um, focus rather than on the diversity hire actually understanding what this individual could bring the yeah, importance of, of cultural adverts versus cultural fit and then finally really reinforcing this by linking comp um, to diversity metrics, which about a third of the experimental partners were doing. I've already said that this is an industry that is not very well advanced, and that's pretty much reflected in the essentially our assessment and indeed the firm's own assessment of their maturity. So you can see the sort of signals which we would take as being quite structural ones as to you know, whether they had employee resource groups established, whether they were gathering metrics and the like. Um, so I think we we and the individual firms essentially um, would conclude the majority weren't yet in the sort of more advanced group, um, but they were working hard to do that. And I think that um, you know that focus on the, the uh, both the organisational inclusion, which was changing policies and practices, and the behavioural inclusion, which is the unconscious bias, the training, the educative work. And bringing those pieces together uh, and ensuring that the whole organization was understanding what the work that they were had, they had embarked on. We heard from the partners that accounting to us and having that say, external accountability um, was a really important part of this. And I know that some of our other speakers have mentioned that external accountability is, is key. These were pretty much the emerging themes that came out of um, the, you know, once the pandemic hit, you know, which was when the programme had already been established. And, and again, you, Ron Hanley mentioned employee resource groups. Well, that was absolutely our experience. They were really key and focused, I think, minds on the way in which DEI became not so much a nice to have as a need to have. Then, of course, the other big impact, um, you know, horrifically so, were the, was the tragic death of not only George Floyd, um, but Ahmed Arbery, um, Breonna Taylor, you know, all too many. And essentially the, the dynamic shifted from, I think systemic racism being words that you didn't really hear CEOs uttering, almost a taboo, to something that was absolutely part of the dialogue. And I think that has been a really significant change. And essentially what we had was um, employees saying, we want resource, we want to understand more than we already do. Um, we had CEOs prepared to make statements and you know, actually commit to actions. Um, again, back to the focus on, on the importance of, of, of actually being accountable for actions, signing up to those, being very visible in that space. And one particularly um, interesting comment from one of our experimental partners, which was, you know, this is our last chance to act. If we don't, we'll lose all credibility that we are committed to acting. And I think that was quite typical um, of the work that we saw, the, the difference in, in attitude um, within, within these firms. So they were sharing stories, they were sort of building dialogue, creating safe spaces to have what were often very difficult conversations, but accepting that the, in the difficulty lies the key to advancement, that essentially the grit in the oyster is what makes the difference. 
and they were also making sure that they were uh, in providing support to their employee resource groups who were you know very strained and stretched by this um, as we went into these, these difficult conversations which they were very much focused on leading and, and being you know, very involved in driving, but nonetheless you know, feeling real fatigue. So we saw firms actually putting extra support and resource behind their employee resource groups because they could see the need and they could see the benefits. So in terms of where we finish with the experimental partner and the sort of overarching themes, I would say the importance of leadership is absolutely key and that's leadership that's visible vocal and accountable and also those governance pieces so i've mentioned employee resource groups typically dei councils um you know that having that infrastructure in place makes a huge difference to kind of keeping firms focused on this work and making other making employees generally feel that they are part of the conversation that they're fully involved so joining this to, to mission and indeed to business strategy. So when DEI is really clearly fully reflected in the business plans, you start to see quite a considerable difference. Communication, more is definitely more. And then the measurement and transparency piece. Overall, we see ownership shifting from HR to business leaders. So essentially, we've got CEOs, CIOs in the light side saying this is our work. But then that what they're doing also is elevating their internal DEI experts. So they are then typically reporting to the CEO or CIO um, and, and actually that whole um, importance attached to this work has shifted quite significantly. What I'd like to shift to now is talking about our diversity, equity and inclusion code because back to the action piece, what we see is, is a need for actually supporting firms uh, using the um, research that we've got garnered from the experimental partner process um, and really building something which sits with our other codes and standards in driving inclusion, equity and diversity through into the industry in a much more powerful way. Now, we're starting this work really with you know, a sense of humility that we know we are very far from perfect. But we do feel we have a capacity through our well-established codes and standards to do this work with the industry. We have an amazing working group, including vendors from Cowpers, uh, um, Marlene from Cowpers, um, and we've had some great advice from our steer co on uh, inclusion and diversity from Chris Aylman and Leshe Vedalita, um, and you know, very appreciative of, of the contribution of those amongst some other leading um, investors. And that focus on a code which is created essentially by investment professionals for investment professionals, we think is a critical piece. So what we're really wanting to highlight is its principles base, it's very similar to, to PRI in that sense, that perhaps if you look back to the early stages of PRI, um, it's collaborative, we're working with Diversity Project North America, and it will be regionally adapted. So the first iteration is for the US and Canada. We'll be updating our implementation guidance annually. And I think that guidance, as I say, leaning on the work that we did with experimental partners and indeed input from other DEI experts um, is a, a key differentiator. And I think the purpose is really a key point here in that we know the reason that we're doing this is that we believe we'll get better investment outcomes, we will be better over to, able to serve our diverse society, and essentially the organisations through this work will be able to create better places to work. We're very conscious of the magnitude of the task, and so we're really being very mindful that the scope of this code is in the workplace where we have that direct agency. These are the principles you can see. We start with that pipeline piece that I mentioned early on. Talent acquisition, absolutely key. We've put a lot of time and effort into our advice around promotion and retention because we know that that's where individuals can be lost, that folks get overlooked and don't get the advancement that uh, they really deserve. Um, and leadership, we think is very important that industry leaders are absolutely um, accountable and very clearly visible in the work that they do. 
we know that asset owners, of course, have a very powerful voice and we want to make sure that that emerges. And the wrap up code here, the wrap up piece of the code is measurement that we're actually very, very concerned that essentially firms are that fully accountable piece, that they are transparent in the metrics that they share uh, and that we, they are going to be asked to report to, to us as CFA Institute and that we in turn will report on the industry as a whole. So while that report is confidential, um, as I say, we CFA Institute will report on what we find across the industry, across our signatories. It's a collaborative piece, it's about sharing and it's about promotion, promoting the importance of this work. Um, and that it can be everything from speaking and socializing the code and the principles, but it can also be, as I say, that collaborative piece to, to drive the beginning of the pipeline and indeed all the way through, because there are many different ways of recruiting experienced hires um, that we've explored in our implementation guidance, um, which will contribute to make, the fir make firms more diverse. So this is pretty much the end of my presentation. I've been very delighted to share this information with you today um, and I would be delighted to explore any further conversations with you.